You know, it, it just really encapsulates what we're trying to do. And I think some of the research people and knowledge really leads us into our next uh, speaker, David Bradley. He uh, is a full-time consultant neurologist um, appointed to St. James's Hospital and is a clin clinical uh, senior lecturer at Trinity College in Dublin. Uh, David graduated from UCD with a first-class honours degree and completed his training in neurology, including a PhD um, with Trinity College. Just as a caveat to that, I, recent, I recently finished um, a master's myself um, in, in leadership and executive management. And one of the things that we uh, module was all about knowledge and knowledge management. And how do we get, say, the fantastic knowledge that a person like David would have, you know, out to you know, the patients in the room, out to the pharmacist like myself, the physio. So there's a great, um, I suppose there's a great um, exploration of, of how do we actually do this type of thing. So one of the things that today, it's all about sharing that knowledge. Um, David's areas would be, subspecialties would include movement disorders and stroke and including the co-running, um, the stroke service at St. James's Hospital and he's received research awards in both fields. In actual fact, I had the pleasure of recently attending a, um, a presentation in America with David uh, to listen um, in relation to Parkinson's and it was, it was very, very powerful. And on that note, it just gives me just a fantastic pleasure to introduce uh, this gentleman who has lots of knowledge and is hopefully going to share it. And it's going to be managing your Parkinson's disease. So thanks very much, David. Okay. So um, thank you very much for the introduction and thanks very much for having me uh, <coughs> speak here today. Um, it's a great honour to be asked to speak in such a, such a huge room and I think the points have been very well made that advocacy and patient groups like this are critically important. Obviously in neurology I deal with other conditions as well and I see the benefit that other types of conditions gain when there's a very strong patient advocacy group. And so I think the, the biggest task for a group like the PAI is to continue to push forward in advocacy and to strengthen itself as much as possible by linking in with hospitals, communities, as many people as possible, just to get momentum going. So from my point of view, I'm going to talk about managing your Parkinson's disease, was the title I was given, so I've tried my best to keep to that brief. It's going to be quite medical, given my background, but I'm trying to have a focus on things that are important for patients and families to know so that they actually can get the most out of some of the treatments that are suggested at hospital level and at community level. So we're going to talk a little bit about an introduction to Parkinson's, some background information on how the condition works. And the reason that's important is because having that knowledge and hearing it many times gives you a lot of strength in terms of figuring out how to deal with symptoms, how to figure out what to do with symptoms and what to ask about. So Parkinson's disease is a very old condition. I mean, the, the coining of the condition name Parkinson's disease goes back to the 1800s when a group of six patients who had Parkinson's were, were described by James Parkinson and then later somebody named the condition after him as was the, the, I suppose, the way at the time. But if you go back even further than that, 5,000 years ago or more, there are descriptions of conditions in texts that were almost certainly Parkinson's disease and even descriptions of herbal type remedies that might help the symptoms in India, for example, going back thousands of years. So this condition has been around for a long time. And I suppose, as you're all aware, the main features that it tends to present with are movement problems. So it's a movement disorder, tremor, lack of movement or slowness of movement and stiffness. They're the conditions that people tend to present with at the very start. And what patients come to the GP complaining of and then come in to see me. But there are lots of other symptoms as well that can occur. And the reason I'm going to talk about them today is because it's very important to know about these symptoms because there are treatments for them. And if you have some of these features, it's important to bring them up with your GP, your consultant, or whoever else. In terms of the condition, as you've heard, is extremely common. The truth is we don't know how much Parkinson's there is in the country because no one is, has a register. But it probably is upwards of 12,000 patients. And certainly, once you get above the age of about 85, depending what country you're in, three up to 5% of the population have a degree of Parkinson's disease. This is very common, and it's much commoner. Uh, it's increasing in incidence because as a, as a population we're getting older. And it's going to overtake and probably has overtaken some of the other common neurological conditions we see, like MS and things like that. So it's becoming more and more of a political um, issue in terms of how do we 
make sure we're resourcing the treatment of this, of this condition properly. And wh what's the cause is a very common question. Well, in most patients, it's idiopathic. That's a fancy medical word for we don't know. We don't know exactly why it starts. We know what's happening. We know very clearly what's going wrong, but we don't know exactly why the process starts. And it's probably what we call multifactorial. Lots of little things act together, and in certain patients, they start to develop this, this problem. In other patients, they don't. Um, we do know a small percent is genetic, and certainly patients under age 40, if they start having symptoms, we would then start looking for genes. And there aren't many described genes, but typical patients presenting 50s, 60s, 70s, the vast majority are, we don't know the cause, um, but we know how to manage it. What's exactly happening? Well, I suppose just from a, a, a very basic point of view, um, the parts of the brain that are involved in Parkinson's and in movement are deep in the brain. They're called the basal ganglia, deep in the brain. These blue structures here. And within these structures, there are lots of little circuits that are important for selecting movements, focusing movements, not too much, not too little. And that's a very complex set of circuitry. And an important part of it is dopamine, a chemical called dopamine, which is actually produced a bit far away down here in the brainstem and it's transported up to this circuitry. And it's the lack of that chemical, because some of those nerve cells are not present, that causes the symptoms in Parkinson's. And most of the treatments we have are designed to replace that missing dopamine. Um, we know at the cellular level, cellular level exactly what's happening. We can see down the microscope in some of these nerve cells exactly what the problem is. The question is how do we get rid of that problem? And as has been mentioned, a huge amount of current research is looking at at the molecular level and at the cell level, how do we get rid of the problem as opposed to just replacing the missing chemical? What about diagnosing the condition? Well, as I said, typically patients will come in with tremor or a bit of slowness of movement, and the question will be what's going on. And if it's a patient who's in the regular age group with the regular symptoms, we don't need to do a lot of tests, and we don't need to subject you to scans or things like that. In the vast majority of cases, we can make a clinical diagnosis of the condition. If there is any doubt, so in a patient who's a bit younger or who has some unusual features, there are sometimes tests we do, but most patients don't need these. And so compared to, say, MS, there's a lot of cost in terms of investigations that isn't required uh, in terms of Parkinson's disease, and that really should be funneled towards treatment. Um, where we do need to do some tests, there are a range of blood tests we sometimes do, and um, there's also a scan called a DAT scan that we can do. Some of you may have had this scan. And what the scan does is, if you go back to our little schematic here, these blue parts, what happens is with this scan is they light up, like you see in the top corner, if there's lots of dopamine around. And if there isn't a lot of dopamine around, they don't light up as well. And so that tells you in a very objective way that that dopamine pathway isn't as numerous as it should be. So if there is clinical doubt, if there's a question that there's something else going on, this scan can be very helpful, but most patients don't need it. The other type of scan we can do is an MRI scan. And again, this is for certain patients where we're not exactly sure that all of the features stack up exactly the way we'd expect them to. Sometimes we do an MRI scan. Again, a lot of patients don't require it. And all this is showing is that the same parts of the brain we mentioned a second ago can be looked at in terms of MRI structural imaging and to see if anything else is explaining the symptoms. So what about the the management of this condition. Well, as you heard, there's a lot of ongoing research, and the research there is to get at the root of the problem, which is what's going wrong with the little nerve cells that produce dopamine and other parts of the brain. Most of the treatments we have now are what we call symptomatic. So what they do is they help the symptoms, and they replace the missing chemical. And I'm just going to have one or two slides on the treatments from my point of view, and then I'm going to really talk mostly about from the patient management point of view, what's important to know about and how can everything be optimized in terms of treating Parkinson's disease. So in terms of the non-medication things first, obviously from the hospital point of view, there's a core, what we call MDT, multidisciplinary team, and they are a group of individuals that the hospital have that are important to work together in terms of trying to get everything right for PD. And their physiotherapy, occupational therapy, speech and language, dietitian, social worker, the nurse specialist is a critical person to have involved, and whatever doctor is seeing you, geriatrician, neurologist. Outside of the hospital session, there's clearly a much wider group, from GP to carers to family to pharmacy, which are also important, but I suppose I'm going to focus on what the hospital does and how to get the most out of that. Okay. Patient support organizations like today is critically important in helping us advance the overall cause of how to best treat Parkinson's disease. Diet and exercise I'm going to touch on because it's a very common question. And then there are some other services we sometimes access at hospital level which are available to us, which we generally don't need, but they're available if we needed them. Okay.
So there's a very large group of people who are all important in trying to get everything right with Parkinson's and they all need to work together and you need to get on with them. So if it's a case you're not getting on with your consultant or your GP, you need to think about changing because having that right is very important. Okay. What about the medications? Just one slide and the, the main point of this slide is to talk about the fact that these are treatments that are based on our understanding of how the condition works. So some of these medications you may be on one or some of these and really the top two which is levodopa and dopamine agonists are the mainstay of treatment. So the levodopa directly replaces the missing dopamine. So it goes in to the brain and it replaces what's missing. Whereas dopamine agonists go in and pretend to be dopamine, they mimic the dopamine there. So both of those try and replace the missing transmission that we see in Parkinson's. As some of the other treatments work differently, some of them try and support the residual amount of dopamine in the brain, and some of them work completely differently, like the anticholinergics, they're for tremor, but they don't affect dopamine at all. So there are a wide variety of treatments, and if a particular treatment is not working, it's up to us to decide what um, is a better option. And we do that in partnership with the patient by discussing how has the treatment worked, what are the side effects, and how can we get things a bit better. And what about the self-management side of things? So I'm going to try as best I can to focus on the self-management. And there's a couple of aspects to that. The first is that understanding as much as possible about the condition is very powerful. It gives you a lot of opportunity to optimize things. Secondly is some of the treatments that are suggested in hospital, they can work better or worse depending on how they're used and understanding how they work. And there are a couple of other issues as well which I'll touch on. So what about um, self-management? Well, I suppose Parkinson's disease is a, is a long-term condition. It, it doesn't go away. And, and I suppose you can compare it to some other conditions, like if you needed a, a cholecystectomy for gallstones, you come in, surgeon takes out the gallbladder, and they send you on your way. So that's a one-off. There's no real need for you to understand how to take out a gallbladder or why gallstones form, because it's a one-off. Parkinson's is different, and like lots of similar conditions, you need to understand how it works so you can manage the condition as best as possible. Okay? And the truth is that patients can manage the vast majority of their symptoms with support, and that's based on us doing a good job of informing patients and explaining things clearly. And, and by far the best way to get the best results is to empower patients to do that, as opposed to being prescriptive, seeing a patient twice a year, and saying, do this, do that, and not really explaining what's going on. And there was a lot of that in the past, and I've seen it in training, and that does not work. So information is power, information about the condition, how it works, the treatments, how they work, and what to watch out for, and also the other services that are available, and to, to make sure that you know what's available to access if you have a particular issue. And I suppose I always mention planning ahead to patients and to families. I mean, these are kind of things we should be all doing anyway. I mean, regardless of what condition you have, or even if you have no medical condition, we should be thinking ahead. Don't leave everything to the last minute. Uh, the aims of treatment is a big question. And sometimes patients uh, at the start, um, it, there's a bit of a, a learning curve in terms of understanding what's important to that particular patient. And you need to set some goals in terms of, we're going to try some treatments, what are we aiming to achieve? And it is very important that everyone's on the same page in terms of that. So the, the aim might be, I have tremor which interferes with painting or writing, and I want to reduce it so that I can write normally. The, t the issue may be I no longer can play golf at the speed I want to, I want to speed that up. But it's important to pick out specific goals that you're going after. Um, in my experience, if there's a discrepancy between what we're thinking and what patient is thinking, things don't work well. Um, my default position is usually that a patient is able to do everything they want to do on a given day and not be particularly bothered by their symptoms. I don't tend to suggest we go for no symptoms because my experience is that that's not often deliverable. Certainly it's not deliverable all the time. And much better is to set a very specific goal that is actually achievable. Okay. And then we need to balance that with not giving too much medication, not causing side effects, and what other options do we have to help the symptoms. So it's very important to get that balance right. And there has to be sometimes a frank discussion so that everyone's on the same page. Because the worst thing is if the physician thinks one thing, the doctor or the patient thinks another, and they're not meeting in the middle, that leads to a lot of issues. So I think that's where some of that probably broke down in the past, lack of good communication. You're going to hear about communication shortly, I think, and that's critically important. And then I suppose in terms of the treatment, 
We talked a bit about the motor symptoms, which is movement, and then the variety of other symptoms that can occur as well, and they both need to be thought about in terms of planning treatment. What about diet? Diet's a very common question, and the only advice I tend to give is to have a healthy, balanced diet. There are no particular things that you need to specifically eat or not eat. It is important to have a general healthy diet. Number one, that helps to avoid constipation. Number two, um, it also helps sometimes with maintaining weight. Um, weight can drop in Parkinson's for a number of reasons. It might be the condition itself, it might be if there's an issue with nausea, not wanting to eat, or it might be nothing at all to do with PD. So don't ever assume that any particular symptom has to be related to the condition. But sometimes we use the dietitian there to do a nutritional review, they call it, and that's marrying up what's being eaten versus weight and seeing if there's a discrepancy. And so I would suggest to watch weight, and that's very important, to tell us if you think there's a change in weight, you should be measured anyway, but say it isn't. You need to tell us about that so that we can look at it with you and decide what the best thing to do is. I do suggest most patients go on a calcium vitamin D supplement as a standard. They're available over the counter. Um, and the other thing to be aware of is bone density. So most patients with Parkinson's should have a DEXA scan every so often to monitor bone density. And if you're not having it done, you need to ask your GP or your hospital to book it for you. And that's an important thing to be aware of. Um, and if there's an issue with bone density, it needs to be sorted out. What about exercise and activity? Again, there are no very specific requirements. There is evidence, research evidence, that maintaining activity and reasonably normal activity is important and reduces the progression of symptoms early on in the condition. So yes, we would always suggest that it's very important for, for patients to keep an eye on their activity and maintain it as much as possible. If help is needed with that physiotherapy advice, then we should go ahead and get that done. But um, there aren't any very specific requirements you must hit. It's just the general healthy activity recommendations you'll read about for cardiac disease and other conditions. Physio are important because they will give you advice around that. If there are other conditions like arthritis, they can help you to plan an exercise program so that you can monitor it yourselves by taking those things into account. And they'll also give you advice about preventing falls because falls is something that can occur in some patients. And so they'll make sure you keep exercise going and you do it safely. What about the medications? I suppose there's a lot to be said about the medication side. Medication is a big part of treatment. Um, pretty much every patient, every patient who has Parkinson's disease will need one or other medication to help support that missing dopamine. And there are a couple of things that are important to talk about in terms of getting the most out of that. I suppose something you'll all be aware of, probably, well hopefully, is that when you're taking particularly levodopa, that you take it away from food. And the reason for that is that it can be reduced in terms of absorption with protein. But not only that, the amount it's reduced by varies. So if you eat always with food, the medication, then on any given day, the amount you're getting varies all over the place. And it's very difficult to work out if a patient is getting enough levodopa, too much or too little. So taking away from food allows a much more reliable amount of absorption. And the function of that is not just being pedantic, it's that we actually want to be able to figure out are you on too much, too little, or the right amount? And that's much easier to figure out if things are nice and regular. Um, take it 30, 45 minutes before food, an hour after. Some patients will benefit from taking a small amount of carbohydrate with it, particularly if nausea is an issue. Um, the second thing is taking at the same times. And again, we will, you should be discussing specific times with your doctor when you're getting prescribed medicines. Early on in the condition, first couple of years, it probably doesn't matter because there are lots of the little dopamine neurons left behind. But later on, it does become more important to get the times right. And, and secondly, as for the, the food, it helps us figure out what to change, when to change it, if the pattern of medication is very regular. If the pattern varies a lot, it becomes very difficult to figure out what to advise you in terms of changing the doses. And the second thing I suppose uh, I want to bring up is um, hospitals. hospitals are not an ideal place to be if you have Parkinson's disease. I see all the time patients who come in have very carefully worked out medication regimens and they change around when coming into hospital because nursing staff, understandably, have set rounds for medicines. So my strong advice, if you're ever in hospital for an operation, an ammonia, for any reason, is be very strong with the staff on the nurse and, or on, the, on the ward and say, I must have my medicines at the exact time I'm supposed to take them. And you can tell them, you know, your physician or your doctor said this is very important. There's two options. Either they go out of their way to do it at the right time, or they let you take it yourself. But they must do one of those two things, because you will definitely 
have a big problem if you miss medication times for a couple of days, it can set you back for a week or more. So that is something I would strongly support you in being strong about with staff if you're ever in hospital. The second thing, I guess, is around surgery. If you're going to miss medications for more than 24 hours, that needs to be planned ahead in terms of... So you need to be aware of that, and if you're seeing someone for an operation, you need to say, how am I going to plan this? And they can talk to us if they need to. Okay. The last thing I'd say about medicines on this slide is not to be afraid to ask about a small increase. So sometimes patients will come in and they will be afraid to ask about a small increase in medication because they feel if my medication dose is going up, that must be bad. What I would say to you is everybody's medication dose needs to go up over time. That's just the way the condition works. It's not a bad thing to need to increase a little bit. It's much worse, I think, to be under-treated and not able to do things you want to do because you're afraid of this idea of going up a little bit in the dose. If you need to go up, we should do that. It does not mean things are going badly. It's just the normal way the condition changes. Okay. What about um, <clears throat> other advice about medicine? So a lot of times medication changes will be advised. Sometimes two or three changes will be advised at the same time. What I would suggest is that when you're changing medications, that you do them one at a time, maybe two weeks apart, because then if there's a problem, you'll know which is the one that caused the problem. Okay. Um, the other thing I'll say about changing medicines in Parkinson's is that the effect can take some time to work. So it can take a week or two for you to fully see what a small increase or a small change actually does as things resettle. And the problem with that is that treatment effect can take time to happen, side effects will come in straight away. So if you're going to get a side effect with the medication, you'll see that immediately. Whereas the benefit, you're not going to see it for a week or two. So if there are side effects, we need to help you to manage them. And there are a couple of options. The first is that you get a side effect, it's quite severe, and we just need to get rid of the medication. It's not for you. The second is there's a mild side effect, and sometimes what happens is if we persevere for two, three days, that side effect peters out and goes away. And the third option is you have a side effect, but we can treat it by changing something else around. So the only thing I'd say about changes is that if we're changing a medication, it causes a problem or side effect, we need to help you deal with it, as opposed to just stopping the medication automatically, because you haven't yet seen the potential benefit that, that that change would make. What about drugs to avoid? Again, you should probably have this as part of general education around the condition, but there are a couple of medications that specifically need to be avoided, and it shouldn't come up, but it does occasionally that patients come in for an operation, they get sickness medications they should not get, and it sets things off for a week or so in terms of the Parkinson's getting worse. It does bounce back again, but that's a week in hospital you don't need. So it's for important, and if you don't have it, to have a list of medications that actually are important to avoid if you have Parkinson's. And it's not a long list, but it's an important list. Okay. What about alternative treatments, of which there are an incredible variety? I don't, uh, I suppose I, I, patients will suggest several alternative types of treatments to me. I don't have an issue with any of them, except for two things. Firstly, I would suggest you don't stop some other medicines you're on suddenly without um, taking advice because that can lead to a withdrawal syndrome occasionally. So, and the second thing is cost. Just keep track of the cost and have a bit of thought about the amount of money that's going into these treatments versus the benefits you're getting. Other than that, I don't have a problem with any particular alternative therapies, particularly if they make the patient feel better. There's no harm in that. The only two caveats are not to stop other medicines suddenly and just keep track of the amount of money it's costing. What about getting the most for other types of treatments? I suppose the other types of treatments that are available outside of medicines, some of which are community, some of which are hospital, physio, OT, speech and language, the, the point to make about those is that like the tablets, they're not one off. Sometimes it's a course of treatment, sometimes it's a set of classes with another set in a year's time and, and, tr and work in between. So like medicines, you need to keep going with those. And, and I suppose working up a schedule and managing that schedule is a big part of patient self-management, I guess. Um, what about individual versus group therapy? I mean, people have all kinds of um, fears and thoughts about group sessions, and a very common theme I get is that a patient will come in and they'll say, yes, I'll have physio, but I prefer to have it one off, and that, that's fine initially. All I would say to you is my experience, is that patients, when they come back, and they've had group classes, group physio, other types of group activities, generally get an awful lot from those. So I would say at least try it. Um, and then there are new European guidelines on the amount of physio and the timing of physio, which actually show that we're underperforming quite a lot in terms of access to these kinds of services. These are critically important, even in early Parkinson's, when things are, are, are quite 
good and there are only one or two symptoms, still seeing a physiotherapist early is very important. What about symptoms to monitor for? I suppose this section is really about symptoms that patients might maybe not necessarily know are related to Parkinson's or might be afraid to ask about or things that actually are important because if we know about them, we can treat them. And if we don't know about them, they can be causing you a lot of trouble unnecessarily, okay? So I suppose there are a huge number of symptoms that could occur with Parkinson's. And if you get a new symptom tomorrow or next month, there are a couple of options. It could be part of the Parkinson's disease. The symptoms fluctuation, there are a large number of them. It could be part of Parkinson's but brought out by one of the medicines we're using. That's very common. It could be a medication side effect, and that'll often be clear because you've just started the new medicine. It could be nothing to do with Parkinson's at all. You're perfectly entitled to have other problems too. And if you do, they need to be sorted out. We have to either, you know, that's sometimes a GP review, running a set of bloods. You don't assume that a, medic, uh, a symptom is either definitely Parkinson's related or definitely not. The important thing is to collaborate and discuss it, okay? And combinations of the above. And I suppose a common, a common request you'll hear from the hospital is to keep a diary. And that can sound very onerous, but a diary could be as simple as, for one or two weeks, keeping a brief note, one or two notes a day, of when you tend to notice your movement is a bit slower, when you tend to notice the tremor is a bit worse, because those patterns over a couple of days are what let us tease out the right changes to make are. It doesn't have to be very complex, it doesn't have to be a blow-by-blow -blow account of all of your symptoms, but if the question is how to get the medicines right, for example, even some insight over a couple of days in a row or one or two weeks is incredibly powerful in terms of choosing the right changes to suggest. And that's something that patients and families can do in, in their own time ahead of even coming into clinic. And then when you come into clinic, you get by far the most out of it. What about some of these non-motor features? So non-motor features are symptoms that are related to Parkinson's, but they don't really have anything to do with movement, speed of movement or stiffness or tremor. They occur in some patients. They don't occur in other patients. But the point is to be aware of them because they, if they are present, we actually need to treat them. So I suppose the first group of conditions are autonomic. So these are automatic functions that should occur normally without any input from us. And a common one is uh, constipation, as you know. I'm going to touch on some of the suggestions for these in a minute. Um, urinary urgency. Postural hypotension is another one that's important. This symptom of feeling lightheaded when you stand up out of a chair after sitting for a while or stand up first thing in the morning, feeling lightheaded or even feeling faint. Um, if that's present, it can be managed, okay? What about sleep and perception? So sleepiness during the day, broken sleep at night, those things are all very, in any patient, in any person, these things cause a problem with attention, with concentration. So if there's a problem with sleep, we can help figure out the best way to treat it. Mood and cognition, those things can sometimes be affected. If they are, we need to deal with them with you, okay? And what about swallowing and speech? Again, those things are less commonly an issue. I suppose speech is something speech and language therapy can help with. But again, they're things that we should be asking about. And if we're not asking about them, you should be telling us if some of these symptoms are present, okay? So these non-motor features, they're common in various combinations. They can come and go in different patients. The important thing is not to ignore them if they're there. And the other thing is that unfortunately, a lot of these things can be worsened by some of the treatments we use on the motor side. So getting that balance right is critically important. So what about this orthostatic or postural hypotension? Well, this is the symptom whereby you feel lightheaded, even faint, when you stand up. And it just, it's another potential cause of a fall in, in Parkinson's, which has some other reasons to fall as well. Most of the medicines we use can worsen it. And I suppose the simple advice and things that you can do yourself to keep on top of this are to to just be aware that sometimes a change in meds is needed. You need to ask your GP or ask us about that. Sometimes sleeping with the head of the bed up 15 degrees um, can be useful because then when you stand up, there's less of a change. Other simple things like being aware of the problem so you stand up in two stages and you get into the habit of doing that. Or there are other things we can do like increasing fluid intake in the morning time, even wearing these TED stockings that you know are for preventing clots on, on airplanes. They can be helpful during the day if, if this is a common symptom. And then, if needed, we can still do more. We can actually, um, sorry, we can actually um, use medication specifically to support the blood pressure. And that's something that we need to introduce if you are able to tell us those simple things are not enough. We need to, to think about that. 
What about cognition and, and memory? I mean, that can be affected for a lot of conditions, and not, not the smallest of which is if sleep isn't right, anybody's attention and concentration will be poor. And so we can help that in a roundabout way by helping sleep. But sometimes uh, patients will have a variety of, of memory symptoms, and the question is, what are they due to? Are they due to sleep? Are they due to the Parkinson's? Are they a medication side effect? And so if you're having some of these symptoms, it is important to tell us so we can tease out what's going on there. And, and a common one, the reason I put a picture of a clock there is because we very often ask patients to draw a clock, and I'm sure a lot of patients think it's very odd, but really what that's doing is looking at visual spatial function. And it's one of the tests that particularly we like doing in Parkinson's because it helps to pick out particular symptoms that could occur. Um, how do we treat it? Well, we know that some of the medications can cause this or worsen it, so we change around the medicines as needed. And there is a specific tablet as well that can improve memory. So the, the issue is if that's been noticed, the issue is to talk to your doctor or the nurse specialist or the GP and actually see how the best way to improve it is. Driving is an issue that often comes up as well and there's lots of reasons why driving can be impaired. Sometimes as you see here it's a personality issue but sometimes um, it's actually due to the due to the medication, sometimes it's due to the condition itself, and the condition itself can be due to two issues. One is movement, and one is that visual spatial function we talked about. So a lot of patients sometimes will be anxious about driving, and if we assess it with them, we can sometimes, well, usually show that actually driving is perfectly fine, and that gives a lot of reassurance. So in terms of what to do, in terms of driving, it is, I suppose, a condition that we would suggest you, you notify your insurance company about. Uh, the worst they're going to do is ask you to fill in a form with us, and that's fine. But actually, we, I would always suggest you do that because you will be astounded at what insurance companies will do to try and not cover claims by going back through medical records. So having it up front with a letter in is definitely the way to go. Um, how can you get information about um, if driving is, is fine or not? Very often, a passenger reports, so husband or wife, friend, whoever's in the car, if their general impression, gut feeling, is that the driving is fine, Nine times out of ten, that's exactly the case. If you're going to look at it a bit more detail, occupational therapy or some of these independent organizations like the IWA do driving assessments. And that can just give you the confidence because you've had a formal assessment done, everything is fine. And that gives you the confidence and the reassurance to get on with driving, which is obviously what we always encourage, get on with everything, normal activity. Sleep symptoms. I mean, sleep is critically important for everybody, okay? And I suppose it's very common to have one or other types of sleep symptoms in Parkinson's, and it's very common that we can help them. Uh, a common one is excessive daytime sleepiness, so feeling very tired during the day, nodding off at times you wouldn't usually. That can be due to medicines, which we can change around. So if that symptom is present, you need to be able to keep an eye on it and tell us about it, okay? Um, another common one is, is vivid dreams. So... Um, Patients will say that they've started having very real dreams, very vivid dreams. They wake up, they feel they're still in the dream. Sometimes they're even a little bit threatening. And, and those kinds of symptoms do occur in some patients. The point about knowing about them is that if you tell us, we can usually help them, okay? As opposed to ignoring it or thinking that couldn't be the Parkinson's, worrying about it being something else. The important thing is to always tell somebody so that we can actually help to improve the symptom. And ORBD I've mentioned at the end, REM sleep behavior, that is an unusual symptom which occurs in Parkinson's and essentially when you sleep, go into REM sleep when you're dreaming, your muscles should be paralyzed normally. That doesn't happen in this condition and in some other conditions as well. So sometimes when you're dreaming, unbeknownst to you, you might have some vocalization or some moving or punching and that's a symptom that again a lot of people think well that couldn't be related to Parkinson's but it is and it's extremely treatable. A small tablet at night turns it off essentially. So it's again something you need to be aware of because if it's present, we can actually get rid of it. And that's important from a management, self-management point of view. Bladder or bowel symptoms, I mean, you, you know that constipation is common in Parkinson's disease. And in fact, it often predates the movement for years. Patients will think back five years, seven years. Yes, you're right, I've had quite bad constipation for a couple of years. There's a couple of reasons to be aware of it. The first is that it reduces the absorption of medicines if it's, if it's bad. And so we would always suggest that patients come up with their own self-management protocol. First bit is diet, getting the diet is nice and healthy. Second is a mild over-the-counter preparation like Senecott at night or something like that. Just a regular background mild agent to keep things at bay. And then if things get troublesome, take something stronger for a couple of days and come off it again when 
when things settle down. That kind of self-management plan that's tailored to each patient is very important and it stays off a lot of secondary problems that occur if constipation isn't managed. Um, urinary symptoms, the common one is urinary urgency where you don't get much warning before you need to pass water, you have to rush fairly quickly to the bathroom. Obviously if in addition to that movement is a bit slower, that's troublesome. The point is that if that is bothering you, we can treat it very effectively. So the important thing is to mention it or talk about it. We should be asking you anyway, but if we're not, tell us so we can actually treat that. In men, obviously, prostate is a second issue, and if the two are present together, sometimes that's where urology will become involved because it's a mixed picture. But the point is, if that symptom is there, we can help you to, to manage it. Mood, I suppose it's important to talk about mood because mood is something that can affect anybody. Anybody who has a new diagnosis such as Parkinson's disease, there's a normal adjustment reaction to that which is completely expected and mood can be, can be a bit variable around that time. Separate to that, mood could also be affected for any number of reasons and if, it, if we think that that is the case, it's very important to treat it because that is a knock-on effect like sleep on everything else. The important thing is not to shy away from talking about this as a potential symptom. Um, sometimes it's difficult to know if, if is somebody's mood down, is it that the energy is down, is it that sleep is poor. Sometimes a good symptom to watch for is if this symptom here, anhedonia, which essentially what that means is losing interest in some of the activities that you usually enjoy. So looking forward to golf on Sunday, certain meetings, meeting up with friends for bridge, if you're losing interest or not as interested in those things as you would normally be, that can be something that tells us, you know, we should look at mood a bit. The important thing is not to leave mood untreated if it's there. Sometimes it requires treatment for a couple of months, then you come off it again. But the worst thing to do is ignore it completely because it has a knock-on effect on everything else. Um, and the last one or two slides I have just are on some of the other th symptoms that can occur on the motor side that we need you to watch for because you need to start telling us about these when they start to happen. As I said at the start, early on, the timing of medication is not that critical. If you miss the medication or it's an hour late, it often isn't noticed because there's a lot of residual neurons producing dopamine that buffer the effect of that medicine. Later on, it does become the case that when you take a medication, it doesn't last for as long. And that's where you have symptoms such as wearing off coming up to the next dose, so you start to get a bit slower coming up to the lunchtime dose. Or you get excessive movements in between because the medication isn't being buffered as well. And there's a couple of ways of managing that. The first is to change around the medicines, and the second is to, to try other types of treatments. But critical in deciding how to best advise you on that is some idea of how things have been for the last couple of weeks, a diary, having the medicines at a fairly routine time. If those things are there, it helps us hugely in advising you what the best changes to make are. Um, in terms of the newer therapies, I mean, there's been a lot of talk about research in curative types of treatments, I suppose, but even the treatments which replace dopamine, of which there are a couple of newer therapies which are actually designed to work where the tablets can't work very well. And I'll just mention them. And the reason I'm mentioning these is because in the past, a lot of these treatments would have been talked about at the very end of the condition. Um, say when you've tried for two, three years and you've had two, three years of things not going well with medications in some patients. And then it's a case of, well, let's think about these. In fact, there's probably a good rationale to talk about these things earlier and not to be afraid to talk about these things earlier if it's a case that in a particular patient, we can't get the medicines right. And the three options, as you probably will have seen in the news, deep brain stimulation is an operation, which actually is to stimulate um, certain parts of the brain to help with the symptoms. And then the other two treatments are pump infusions. One is this treatment here, um, LCIG, and what that does essentially is Cinemash is in a gel form, and it's introduced into the gut nice and evenly so that you don't get any variability in absorption. And the third one is apomorphine, so that's like an agonist. It's a very old drug, actually, and it's a subcutaneous um, infusion. So these treatments are there. The reason I mention them is because sometimes uh, patients wonder why we're talking about some of these newer treatments. Does this mean things are going very badly? That isn't the case. What happens is every patient responds differently to medicines. Sometimes these types of things need to be thought about where we can't get the tablets right. That doesn't mean the condition is going badly, that just means we can't get the balance right in a particular patient. And we should think about these if it's going to be the difference between not being able to function well and being able to function well. Because that's overall the aim. Um, what about thinking ahead? I suppose you've heard a little bit about 
potential future treatments. This is an incredibly active research community. And there's a huge push now from the symptomatic treatments, which are how do we replace dopamine, how do we do that better, to how do we get rid of the underlying problem, the problem with the nerves themselves that are causing them to reduce in number so we don't have what we need. And I suppose there's an overlap with other conditions there because a lot of other conditions are also characterized by protein deposition, things happening to neurons that cause them to not function. And so actually some of the techniques that will be useful in treating these, there's an overlap between conditions. And there's always the option to optimize current treatment as well, which we just talked about. So I suppose this, the summary would be that Parkinson's disease is common. It's very treatable. But the important thing is that we know what the symptoms are so we can advise you best on how to treat them. It is critical to have a partnership between the patient, the doctor, and the MDT. And the MDT is everybody at hospital, community level, who's important in making sure things are as good as they can possibly be. The aim is to get on with living normally and setting a goal that what you want to do is do everything you want to do normally, not be bothered by symptoms. And then we make changes where needed on top of that. And there are lots of ongoing advances in treatment, which, you know, this is an incredibly large uh, research area. We were at the MDS uh, earlier in the year where thousands and thousands of different researchers from different parts of the world all presented research on this. The issue with research is always that it's a little slower than we'd like, but it is definitely progressing at this time. So I would say that's a very positive outlook from a management point of view. And our job in the meantime is to get the condition as controlled as possible in every patient. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. I, I just love listening to experts in, in, in their fields, and you know, I always come away, you know, learning something. So, thank you so much, David. Uh, <coughs> for me, I, I just, you know, to say the taking of the medication—it's it, it, so important. You know, it, its relationship with food, for example, are, are we are we taking the medication correctly? I think that's very, very important. The stopping of meds. Sometimes, you know, I as a pharmacist, people come in, those medicines aren't working. I, I didn't take them for the last couple of weeks. It's very, very important, you know, that that should be communicated with the GP or the consultant, just to make people aware. And again, you know, we're talking here about people and groups and the positive effect that groups can have on, on, uh, on the condition. So on, on that note, I'm, I'm just going to open up the floor for, for some questions for David. And if anybody has a question, um, it's the volunteers in the blue have, have the microphone. So has anybody got a, a question that they'd like to ask? Don't be shy. Anybody? Yeah. Here we go. Fantastic. Yeah. Linda, how are you? Yeah. Vivid dreams, David. The top of the yeah, so I mean, sometimes we use, um, for the RBD, the, the movement at night, clonazepam is the one we usually use. For the vivid dreams, there's a couple of options depending on what else is going on. So if there are vivid dreams and also some memory symptoms, we could try rivastigmine, Exelon is one. And if vivid dreams and perceptions are a problem at night, the other one we sometimes use is quetiapine, which is a very mild medication used for things like abnormal perceptions, visual illusions, that kind of thing. So there are the options, but it very much depends on the individual patient, what else the patient is on. Sometimes the correct thing is actually to remove something else the patient is on that's causing the problem. And sometimes what we like to do is when there are two or three problems that could be treated by the same treatment, to, to I suppose, tailor the types of treatments that particular patient is on to them individually. So it very much depends on the individual circumstances of the patient. Okay. Is that okay? Here we go first. Yeah, Bernie Brady, just on um, the dreams, does alcohol have any effect or not on, you know, nightmares, vivid dreams? Um, that's a, probably a loaded question. I suppose my general advice with alcohol is one or two of what you're having is fine. Excess alcohol is lots of other potential. You don't have to have no alcohol at all. I suppose the truth is if a particular individual patient has the experience and, and knows from monitoring their symptoms that alcohol specifically for them worsens the symptom, then it's a reason to avoid it. But it's similar to migraine. We talk about um, diet and migraine and watching for red wine and chocolate. Only 10% of patients with migraine actually have those triggers and 90% don't. So you don't need to automatically avoid alcohol if it's not clear to you that it's worsening your symptoms. But my general advice is one or two of what you're having. Okay. 
There we go. Hello, um, Brian Lee from Cavan. Um, just two things quickly, David, please. Well, the first is, uh, would you recommend any particular type of sleeping tablet for the, the sleep deprivation and uh, mm -hmm. you know, fitful, mm -hmm. non-restful sleep? I think I would prefer not to have a sleep medication. Usually what I prefer to do is figure out what's causing the problem. Is it problems with getting up to pass urine at night? Is it problems with being very stiff in the middle of the night that wakes the patient and sorting those issues out so the sleep is restful? Sometimes, particularly in hospital, for example, patients might want to use a night sedation, but my general approach is to avoid them if possible because, number one, they stop working after a while, you may need to increase the dose. Number two, when you do come off them, they cause trouble because you almost always withdraw from them and you can have a week or two of very poor sleep. So my preferred option is not to go on them in the first place and actually figure out what the problem is. Sorry, the, the other thing was... Uh the, um, my wife has found that her vision has become very much impaired over the last while. Um, her eyes have been tested by opticians, two opticians, and also by an ophthalmologist in the local hospital. And uh, they've all said that there is, there's actually no, should be no problem with them. And uh, that uh, her eyes are perfectly healthy. And they seem to be pointing to the fact that uh, it must be a side effect from one of the medications that she's taking. Yeah, it could. So. it's potentially possible. I mean, with side effects, as, as I said during the talk, usually side effects come on relatively immediately when you start a medication. So sometimes that helps a lot. You can say, well, I started getting blurred vision after I started X. We come off it. There are other reasons why vision may be different in Parkinson's disease, whether it's blurring or double vision or other things. So there are potentially other reasons related to the condition itself where vision is different, but it's, we'd have to know the exact details and what the ophthalmologist found exactly. But it's potentially possible it could be a side effect of medicine. Um, it could also be related to the condition itself, and you'd need to assess it very carefully to decide which is the issue, I guess. Um, as I said with side effects, if you start off a medicine and you get a mild side effect, it may be worth persevering persevering a day or two and see if that peters out. If it's a marked side effect, you feel rotten starting a new medication, there's no point persisting with that. Um, and you may just need to go back to where you were. And my default position whenever I change medicines in a patient is, if you have a big problem, go back to exactly what you were on and let me know. That's great. Thanks very much. And we'll discuss it a little in more in detail with you when we come to see you in a week or two. <laughs> Thanks, David. Thank you. Over here. So, sorry, Marcus. Just one second, William. Yeah, no second. We'll get you in a second. No problem. Uh, Mike is working. Thank you. Medication that we're taking before, during, or after meals. So I suppose before or after, so 30 to 45 minutes before, an hour after, I mean, sometimes we have to compromise. I do have patients who have come to me who have been put on old regimens of seven or eight doses a day, which is not ideal. Generally, you should not be on more than about five doses a day, but sometimes we need to compromise. Sometimes the timing cannot be perfect every single day, and sometimes nausea is an issue, and nausea is less if you take it with the medication. But ideally, we can work out a way either with a second medication or with a small amount of carbohydrate, that you don't take medicines with meals generally because the protein, which varies day to day, means that the amount you're getting varies and it's very hard to work out then what, what changes to make, if any, when we're seeing a patient back in clinic. Okay. Next question. Hello. Uh, my name's Ivor Davies. My wife is due to have an operation shortly. It's a very personal one nothing to do with Parkinson's. Apparently it's bleeding from one nipple occasionally. The operation is due in the next couple of weeks and I understand from the hospital doctor at the uh, breast clinic that Parkinson's sufferers may uh, find a deterioration effect from the um, anaesthetic. 
And this is what bothers my wife, whether to go ahead with the operation. It's a kind of a catch-22, isn't it? My general advice is that the anaesthetic itself shouldn't cause a problem with Parkinson's. What tends to cause a problem is the medicines are messed up around the time of surgery. That can be gotten around if it's planned properly. But generally speaking, if there's a problem around surgery, it's because medicines have been missed for 24 hours or more, or the timings are changed because coming into hospital results in a big change. And that makes the Parkinson's deteriorate. It can be gotten right, but the problem is you have an extra week or two in hospital you don't need while we're trying to regain that ground. So it is important to pre-plan uh, and it depends what medicines patients are on. Sometimes if you're on one of the patches, it doesn't make any difference. It doesn't have to be interrupted. Sometimes it can be just pre-planned how to get it, it right so that the medication is interrupted as little as possible. The anaesthetic itself, in general, unless there's some other major cardiac or pulmonary condition, I would not have a general concern about anaesthetics or Parkinson's. But the anaesthetist will make a, an individual call on that when they assess a patient pre-op. They make an individual assessment of the anaesthetic issues and that's probably the best person to speak to. I suppose the question is really, is there any alternative to an anaesthetic? It depends as far on the, as the hospital is concerned. No, it depends on the operation, whether they can do it under local as opposed to a that's general. That's really a, a, our next question will be for the doctor. Yep. But thank you, Bjorn. <laughs>
Number two, speech and language as part of their general assessment will often talk about swallowing and that kind of thing. But number three, it may just be the case that we need to do something with the salivary glands themselves, for which there's a couple of options which could be discussed with you to pick the one that suits best. Okay. Th thank you, uh, David. We have time for one more question, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Um, my question is taking uh, new pro patches for um, unsteadiness on my feet. And uh, I was on two milligram. Now I started on four milligram from yesterday, but so far they don't seem to be working. So I suppose two things about that. If you've gone up on the dose yesterday, it's too early to know the effect. Four milligrams is fairly low, so it may well be there's need to go up. The thing you mentioned though was that it was for unsteadiness. And it's yeah. important to be aware that in terms of the unsteadiness or those balance reflexes being reduced, the medicine does not very well for that. It does much better for slowness, for stiffness, and for tremor. So actually, if unsteadiness is the issue, the biggest and most important factor is physiotherapy and retraining some of those balance reflexes and the walking posture. So yes, as the treatment goes up, you may notice more of an effect, and that helps with the walking, but physio is also very important, and the two need to happen together. I see, but I have no problem whatsoever with walking. You, I can walk two, two and a half miles of there, but, you know. Well, then I would suggest you maybe you need to go up a bit higher, and if you've only gone up in the last 24 hours, then that's probably too soon to see the real effect of that. But I agree with you, four milligrams is on the lower end, so it makes well, sense. Well, I'll be on that according to my uh, yeah. uh, neurologist for, for the next three months. Well, you know, then it may be the case that getting onto the hospital or getting your GP to get onto the hospital, oftentimes when, when I do a letter, I'll suggest the next change to make. Um, if this isn't sufficient, go up to this and that. I don't know if you're, it depends on the, the GP and the hospital. But, you know, I wouldn't wait three months if you're yeah. on a higher dose and you're getting nothing from it. Either get onto a hospital or get GP to do it for you just to actually say, well, what's the next change that would be useful to make? And I often head that off by putting it in the letter because it is common that you make a change and actually another change is needed. I wouldn't wait for, for 12 weeks though to make that change. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, sir. We have one gentleman down here in the blue. Uh, Richard Connell. Um, doctor, is there any association between hemochromatosis and Parkinson's, a condition I have but is treated? Um, if, it's, if you have hemochromatosis as well treated, no. I mean, hemochromatosis untreated can have movement symptoms that mimic Parkinson's. There isn't really a direct link. Um, they're both not uncommon conditions in this country. Um, once the hemochromatosis is well controlled, then it shouldn't have a direct impact on the Parkinson's or be a cause of the primary cause of the Parkinson's or have a big impact on the treatment of it. Okay, thank you. David, thank you so much for a fantastic presentation. I, I think we learned so much. Fantastic. Uh, yeah, wonderful. wonderful.